and never forget the price paid for their freedom. How do you summarize and capsulize memories of a man of such diverse talents and achievements into one brief note? Very difficult when there is so much to say. As you know, he was a surviving veteran of the Normandy invasion of France. To be more specific, he was in Company A, transferred to Company B just two weeks prior to the invasion. He was in the 116th Regiment of the 29th Division, who landed with the first wave on the dark green sector of Omaha Beach on that infamous date of June 6, 1944. He was only 19 years of age. There were about 30 men in his boat team, of which only two survived, Hal and Charlie Connors. Incidentally, Hal drew a Star of David on the back of his jacket. He was wounded five times, luckily managed to survive, and hoped to live a deserving life, a good life, and to help his fellow man. He always felt he owed a payback to God for sparing his life. Fast forwarding some years, he continued on with his education in spite of many surgeries to try to put him back together. I can attest to him having terrible nightmares and he would be agonizingly shouting, get down, get down. He could not stop thinking about his buddies on the green sector of Omaha Beach, gunned down, drowned, blasted to bits, horribly annihilated, red streaked waters, sand streaked like it was painted with a red paintbrush, and he'd hear excruciating sounds of moaning and groaning and screaming, body parts strewn across the beach, guts hanging out, and the horrible, horrendous annihilation of so many buddies. He could never forget. He was the eyewitness of that massacre. He always said he saw things that no other 19-year-old should ever have to witness. To cut to the chase, after the war, he married, completed his education, and he taught at Palm Beach High School for five years, never ever talking about his military life. Inwardly, he always thought he was destined to do more to help his fellow man. He returned to school and got a medical degree, eventually becoming a physician. More payback to God for saving his life on D-Day. He was an outstanding physician, a caring and compassionate man. He frequently used the barter system for his patients from low-income families. We were always supplied with eggs, tomatoes, pecans, figs, and many delicious home-baked goods. He still never spoke about D-Day except to his family. Fast forward 44 more years from 1944 to 1988. We were invited to vierville sur mer Omaha Beach, Normandy, France, for the unveiling of a 29th Division monument. Hal did not want to go because he thought it would be too painful. But his wife, insisted and persisted, and so we went. It was an emotional, tear-filled trip, to say the least, especially visiting Omaha Beach and the American Cemetery in Colville. Hal pointed out to me so many of the graves on, uh, with crosses and stars of the boys that died that day. I believe there were over 2,500 American soldiers all perished on that one D-Day. June 6, 1944. On the flight over, he met his medic, Cecil Breeden. Neither of them thought the other was still alive. Can you imagine the emotions of two grown men shared at the moment they discovered each other had survived? Two grown men hugging and crying, nightmarish remembrances, and now solid joy each other had made it. That was a two-man reunion I will never forget. Once Hal discovered there were so many 29er survivors, 
He started to attend the 29th Division reunions. In fact, years later, he was awarded a plaque naming him the ambassador for all the fallen brothers in arms of the 29th Division of Omaha Beach. Fast forward a few more years, and the true turning point of his life began when he met Dr. Stephen Ambrose, co-founder of this museum. Dr. Ambrose had him record his story of D-Day, and Stephen thought that Hal's recall, his remembering all the buddies, and his articulation was amazing. They developed a very close friendship. Stephen definitely was his mentor. He encouraged him, he prodded him, and he urged him to talk about it, tell about it, give speeches, write about it, and not let this history be forgotten. Hal, he said, there are historians who can do it, but you are an eyewitness to the door green sector of Omaha Beach. You must speak for all those boys that cannot. That is another reason that God spared you on D-Day, to keep those boys' names alive and their stories. You can do it, and you must do it. Hal worshipped Stephen. He read every one of his books. Stephen was his hero, his mentor, his advisor, and his friend. He heeded his advice. Perhaps that was his catharsis. Hal did take some did write some books and began his passion to talk about it, to tell about it, all about the landings on Omaha Beach and D-Day, and always mentioning his buddies, his brothers in arms. Never forget my buddies. He mentioned their names, where they came from, and everything he could think of about them. Hal was the very first veteran speaker at this very museum. He spoke here many times and many years and continued to be involved. He was honored to speak at the 10th anniversary, too. He always ended his speeches with, never forget my buddies. His mission and his passion in life was to keep those names alive. He truly was a spokesman for every brave man on Door Green Sector of Omaha Beach. And he said, yes, it was because they no longer could speak for themselves. He was like a poster boy for all those that made the supreme sacrifice. He always mentioned his buddies by name, names like Robert Garbett, Bedford Hoback, Robert Dittmar, Harold Donaldson, Harold Weber, Russell Pickett, Stanley Gambola, Clarence Riggs, Clarence Roberson, and I could go on and on, but time would forbid it. Every single speech, book, and dedication Dr. Howell ever made always included, never forget my buddies. The importance of Dr. Howell's legacy enduring at this museum is not just to remember his name, but to remember his purpose. All the brothers that lived and died on D-Day, Howell was like a banner waving, remember my buddies. Hal is gone now, but this story will live on. A humongous thank you to all my loving family, but a special thank you to my New Orleans children, Karen and Leopold Scher, for making this commemoration possible. They are amazing good people as well. They are true believers in honor thy father. Not only Dr. Hal Baumgarten, but also Leopold's dad, Joseph Scher, a Holocaust survivor. We shall never forget. And now a tremendous thank you to this museum and its wonderful staff. I want to thank Nick Mueller for his kindness, for his friendship, and his dedication over the many years. I want to thank Stephen Watson, whom we came to meet and love and adore on one of our trips to Normandy with this museum. We could see that he was an outstanding leader and a clear friend from the beginning. Also, thank you to Jeremy Collins, who stole our hearts with his outstanding care, his kindness, and concern for us over the years. We appreciate all the staff. The staff here are phenomenal. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention Tom Brokow, another dear friend who, when I lost Hal, wrote a note that said, Hal was the greatest of the greatest generation. One more note, my opinion, 
about this amazing museum. This museum is within itself one huge medal. It is not a gold medal. It is not a silver medal. It is not a bronze medal. No, it isn't any of those. It is not any of those. But it is a rock medal, a rock medal for this nation. It is one big, solid rock of a medal, and it is a rock that records, represents, respects, remembers, reveres, and really reminds and remembers at the same time. Freedom is not free. And God bless you. God bless America. And remember those buddies. Thank you. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. We had 85% casualties, first 15 minutes. I was wounded five times. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped and battle-hardened. He will fight savages. When our ramp went down, the signal for every machine gun on that beach to open up on the exit to our ship. Harold Donaldson, the lieutenant, was gunned down in the boat, like you see in Saving Private Ryan. The feller in front of me, Clarus Riggs, was machine gunned on the ramp. I dove in behind him. Only my left side of my helmet was creased by a bullet. So we were losing men right and left. The water was full of blood. There were a, a group of us running across the beach with our rifles at port arms, which is the rifle across your chest. When we got to about 135 yards, away from the seawall, a machine gun spray came from the trenches up on the, uh, the bluff. And I heard a loud thud on my right front and my rifle vibrated. I turned it over. There was a clean hole through its receiver, which is a little rectangular plate in front of the trigger guard. My seven bullets had stopped in the magazine section, had stopped the German bullet. Another thud behind me to the left, and that guy was gone too. I hit the sand behind the hedgehog, which is about 130 yards from the seawall. And uh, I observed to my right, uh, Private Robert Dittmar, Fairfield, Connecticut. I was yelling, uh, laying. he tripped over the hedgehog, spun completely around, lying on his back and yelling, I'm hit, I'm hit, mom, mother, and then he was silent. I looked over to my left and Sergeant Clarence Robeson of Lynchburg, Virginia. I always mention their names and where they came from. I don't want people to forget about them. Clarence Robeson was staggering by me without his helmet, gaping hole in the left side of his forehead. His blonde hair was streaked with blood. I was yelling, get down, this used to be my nightmares. I'd be yelling, get down, because uh, I never forgot that scene. And I guess he couldn't hear me anyway. The noise on that beach was horrendous. He staggered all the way behind me to the left, knelt down, and he started praying with his rosary beads. And the machine gun up on the bluff fired over my head and cut him in half. I have full confidence in your courage devotion to duty and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. I was cursing that pillbox on the right flank and a shell went off in front of me, 88 millimeter. It blew off this cheek, gave me a hole in the roof of my mouth. I had teeth and gums laying on my tongue. This jaw was shot away, left upper jaw. 
the cheek was flapping over my ear. And I looked in to my left front and Bedford Hoback of Bedford, Virginia got hit with the same shell uh, right in the face and went under the four inches of water. He was dead. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Wow. Thank you to Rita and Dr. Hal and the Scher family. France, in addition to its ties to our great state of Louisiana, is inextricably linked to the legacy of D-Day as not only the site of the invasion, but more importantly, as a site of liberation. We stand together in this commemoration as sister nations, bound by a common and enduring struggle for equality and freedom. So now I'd like to introduce and turn it over to Vincent Schiama, the Consul General of France and Louisiana, for his remarks. Hello, I'm Vincent Schiama, Consul General of France in Louisiana. Last year, I addressed you with a video message because the health context in Louisiana did not permit us to gather together in person. Today again, I'm speaking to you this way uh, because unfortunately I cannot join you today. But what a victory to be able to reunite in such an essential place of memory in New Orleans, the World War II Museum. It's such a comforting feeling knowing that you are sharing this moment in the magnificent Boeing Center to commemorate the day where everything changed. World War II is an enormous part of our collective memory. It's one of those moments and events that defines us as nations, as individuals. It haunts us. It's something that passed on for generations. D-Day, for many people back then and today, resonates as the beginning of the end of World War II. The destiny of our families and the destiny of millions of families in France were transformed forever because of the courage of American soldiers that landed on the beaches of Normandy that day. It was a liberation of our country, but beyond that, it was a reaffirmation of freedom and dignity on European soil. Today is an opportunity to remind us how precious the friendship between France and the United States is. And each time we have to fight for the rights of liberty and democracy, France and the United States stand together. These ideals run deeply in our veins. Our friendship has held strong for 250 years, reinforced by the sacrifices of men and women who fought for a cause bigger than themselves. We must remember this and honor this memory. Looking back at what we have been through this last year and up until today, I cannot help but draw a comparison with our troubled times and think that we too are reaching the end of this tunnel. For French people, World War II brings back images of the resistance, it brings back images of hardship, the guerrilla warfare, the ambushes, the fear, but also positive images the companionship, the incredible bravery of ordinary people who came together and in a collective effort defeated the enemy. We remained steadfast together. We resisted together. We will remember this common effort and we will commemorate it like D-Day as a celebration of mutual aid and victory over adversity. Let's hope that next year and on the following months you will be able to join us on the beaches of Normandy uh, to celebrate all together this incredible moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schiama. Uh, now I'd like to introduce the museum's own Dr. Rob Satino, Executive Director of the Institute for the Study of War and Democracy, and the Samuel Zamuri Stone Senior Historian to discuss the historical context of today's ceremony. I'll uh, echo what everyone else has been saying. It's so good to see live human beings in a room and to be able to talk face to face and person to person. Um, something you would take for granted in normal times, but none of us will ever take for granted again. I call my brief remarks today uh, a year on the beach. You know, it's been an amazing uh, year, actually a year plus, and I'm sure I don't have to tell anyone uh, that. 
Uh, as things slowly begin to return to normal, we're, we're once again able to have personal uh, contact and to do uh, live uh, events here at, at the museum. It seems like an appropriate time to reflect on just what the country has been through, uh, where we've been, and, and where we're going to be going from here. You know, I'll add this, it seems entirely appropriate to talk about these things today on this memorable anniversary in our nation's history. 77 years ago today, as you've now heard a few times, June 6, 1944, U.S. and Allied forces landed in Nazi-occupied Europe. It was a, a day that called for courage, uh, more courage than most of us in this room can possibly imagine, although there are a couple of veterans who can well imagine it here today. While it may seem odd at first, I've, I've been thinking about courage, about the similarities between that fateful June day and what the country has been through uh, recently, between World War II and, and COVID, in other words, and, and about the lessons that, that we uh, have learned, I'm always at hopefully. Back in 1944, as in 2020, the country was facing a dangerous and frightening enemy. We, We'd been taken by surprise by a kind of sudden attack. We, we were, as a people, uncertain and confused at first. We had suffered and continued to suffer heavy losses, but we had weathered the initial onslaught. Uh, we recovered our confidence, and we gradually began to confront our fears more directly. Back in 1944, as in our own day, none of it came easily. The situation seemed so uncertain. Everything was apparently in flux. I think of those brave men, boys really, 19-year-old, uh, uh, on those Higgins boats, Hal Baumgarten, Dr. Hal and the rest. They did not really know what to expect when the ramp went down, but they had to be ready for anything. They had to react to totally unexpected developments. They had to think and do on the fly. And hopefully those are things we all learned to do in the, uh, in the past year or so. Back then, as in our own day, Americans did their duty and then some, and, and many proved themselves to be heroes. Uh, Hal Baumgarten and the rest of the assault force on those D-Day beaches had a job to do. They had a sense of duty. They had the guts to quite literally stare death in the face. You know, in a quieter way, uh, we saw those same kind of characteristics, those same kind of guts all over the country in 2020 and 2021. Whether it was your local grocery store workers staying open when you needed them most, my wife and I live here in the neighborhood, without a grocery store it would be a very, very difficult place to, uh, to live, but they stayed open. To our brave staff here on the floor of the museum, to first responders doing their thing, it was an inspiring thing in many ways to be an American in the last 12 or, or 18 months. Um, I, I'm alive right now because first responders came to my apartment and got me to a, to a hospital when I was having a very serious health problem. Details available upon request, as I like to say. I won't go into uh, It was not COVID related, but when, when an ambulance comes to your apartment and, and the EMTs are in full hazmat gear, this was April of 2020, you know you're living in unusual times. And I was thinking of the guts of someone leaving their house in the morning, bye honey, saying to your wife or to your husband, and putting on a full hazmat suit to go to work. And those were the EMTs in, in my apartment that day. You know, finally, and I think this is the key, then as now, Americans refused to despair, even in the face of a dangerous and terrifying ordeal. Uh, every year before we stage this memorial event, I, I go back and I re-listen to Dr. Hal's oral history. It's a little ritual I have. You've seen pieces of it, his video interview with the museum. And it doesn't get any uh, less dramatic, no matter how many times I hear it. Uh, you, you've heard Dr. Hal say this, but I, I want to reiterate just a couple of facts. Within the first few moments of the invasion, 28 of the 30 men on his boat are killed. He has a single friend. He and a buddy named Charles Connor are the last men standing. Hal's company as a whole suffers the monstrous total of 85% casualties in the first 15 minutes of D-Day. Hal himself is hit and wounded no fewer than five times in the course of the landing three times on June 6th and twice more the next day. Horrible wounds, I might add, to his face and jaw and foot. He could have despaired and he could have given in. He could have sat down on the beach and refused to move. Instead, his response was to keep moving, to keep fighting, to press forward. You know, as Hal puts it so well later in the oral history, fighting was a simple matter of logic. He said, we were left with options. We could stay there and die. We could give up the beach to the Germans. We could fight wounded. 
Since options one and two were unacceptable, he said, we decided to fight wounded. You know, it's modest talk. It's the way real heroes talk about their heroics, almost always very, very modestly. But, but Hal's words are to me what D-Day was all about and what the legacy of D-Day is for all of us as Americans today. No matter how dark things might appear, never despair, never give up, never surrender. You know, I sincerely hope we never have another year like 2020 in my lifetime. But if we do, I hope we remember that we will always have heroes on whom we can look back. Guys who never gave up or gave in. Individuals who refuse to let despair cloud their judgment. And who, for me, stand as the very best that America has to offer. Dr. Hal Baumgarten and all the brave men, Americans and allies, who fought alongside him on June 6, 1944, 77 years ago today. We'll never forget Hal or his buddies. Thank you very much. At this time, we would like to take a moment of silence and the benediction. Before our closing benediction, we take a moment of silent reflection, memory, and blessing. Eloheinu velohe avotenu vimotenu, God of our ancestors. We pray that the sacrifices of those who came before us light the path for a peaceful and just world. We remain steadfast in our commitment to the pursuit of a day when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. We pray for the strength to be our brother's keeper and recognize the divine image in all of God's creations. We strive to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly in the light of God. Adonai oz le'amo yiten, Adonai yivarech et amo shalom. May God grant strength to our people. May God bless our people with peace. And let us say, Amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. A very special thanks to Mr. Meyer and Mr. Lowry for joining us today. As you continue your visit and explore our exhibits, I encourage you to spend some time visiting our original D-Day exhibit, the D-Day Invasion of Normandy, on the third floor of the Louisiana Pavilion. This, exhi this exhibit features the watch that Dr. Howell was wearing on Omaha Beach that day. Also in the Louisiana Mem Memorial Pavilion, near the main entrance, is a table where we invite our veterans uh, and active duty service members to pick up a knit your bit scarf in recognition of our nation's gratitude to your service. As we continue to celebrate the museum's birthday today, uh, we're offering free cupcakes to museum visitors with the purchase of a meal as supplies last at the American Sector Bar and Restaurant. You put in my little ad there. Uh, and now please enjoy this rendition of Happy Birthday performed by the Victory Bells, who you can see again free at 1230 right here in the U.S. Freedom Pavilion. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again soon at the National World War II Museum. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday from the Victory Bells. Happy birthday to you and many more. Thank you for coming today. <laughs>